morning, church. It's good to be together. Why don't you stand? Let's sing together on this song. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. Let's sing together. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away, Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus, hear the sound. Turn to you in your kingdom, broken lives are made new. You make us new, because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away, Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. I'll hail the power. I'll hail the power of Jesus. Name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown
good morning, Faith Family. It's so good that we're able to worship the Lord together. I'm thrilled that you've joined with your family, gathering around, looking at a screen of some sort, and joining with us today. You may be watching us on Facebook Live. You may be watching us on YouTube Live. You may be watching us on Satella Faith through our local cable channel. And you may see this video later, uh, but we're thankful that you're here. And I just want you to know that I love you, your pastors love you, and we're here for you. Please, in this time where we're separated by distance, know that you're being prayed for and loved and that we want to do whatever we can to be a blessing and minister to you. And so please, if you need us, call me, call Pastor Jeff, Pastor Justin, uh, call our office, and we'll, we want to do whatever we can to help you. But I'm glad that you're here today. My prayer is, is that God will just speak to you, that we'll worship him together uh, through singing, through preaching, through praying, and that the Lord will be glorified. Know that I love you and I can't wait. Let's worship the Lord together. Let's love singing this song on Palm Sunday. Crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. The Lamb upon his throne. Mark how the heavenly anthem drowns. Oh, music. Shout your praise. 
is our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. One more time, all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great. Father, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for your word that is true. Lord, I thank you for the cross. Lord, as we dive into your word today, Father, I pray that it would not just be another time where we've gathered around the word. God, help us not to be only hearers of the word, but God, may we be doers of the word. Lord, we want to hear your voice. God, we want to obey you. We want to do what you have called us to do. And so, Lord, I pray for your glory and for the good of your people. Father, you will speak to us powerfully. Lord, glorify Jesus through this time together. And Lord, may we stand back in awe and cry from the depths of our heart, thank you for the cross. Lord, we thank you for the cross. Lord, today... Allow us to see just how vitally important the cross truly is. Jesus, I love you, and I praise you in your name. And God's people said, amen. If you have a copy of God's Word, and I certainly hope that you do, I invite you to grab it, please, and open to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 15. When you turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, you'll understand that this is the historical account of the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, all of us who are even remotely familiar with church, we have heard this story. We have heard that God sent His only Son, that He lived a sinless life, that He was crucified by the Romans. And so we've heard this story before. But I want us to listen carefully to this recounting of the story. And today's message will be different. Normally, I will take a single passage of Scripture and walk expositionally through the passage. But I really want us to kind of zoom out today. As we think about the cross and think about the implications of the cross, I want us to kind of zoom out to see what it is that God would have us see about the cross. If I were to title the message today, it would simply be this. Thank you for the cross. Thank you. For the cross. Mark chapter 15. If you have found your place there, I invite you to, as we always do, stand with me together, please, to honor the reading of God's precious word. Mark chapter 15. We're going to begin reading there in verse 22. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him 
and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with the transgressors. That's important. The scripture was fulfilled. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest, also along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine put it on a reed and gave him the drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion, who was standing right in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Father, speak now, and may we obey in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can be seated. Listen, when you think about this passage, one phrase that stuck out to me was, and it fulfilled the Scripture. When you think about it, one of the greatest arguments as to the truthfulness of the Bible is the fact that hundreds, if not thousands of years before, Prophecies concerning the Jewish Messiah were made by prophets in the Old Testament only to be fulfilled by Christ in the New Testament. Let me give you just a few of them. Psalm 41 says this, that the Messiah would be betrayed by a friend who ate bread with him. Does that sound familiar? Zechariah 11 said that the Messiah would be sold out for 30 pieces of silver. Isaiah 50 predicted that his back would be beaten and that he would be spit upon. Isaiah 53 said that he would be crucified with criminals. Psalm 22, written by David. In that trilogy of Psalms, Psalm 22, 23, and 24 that we, I mentioned last week, we see that he was going to be pierced. Now, don't forget. David writing through the prophetic lens before crucifixion was even invented. David said that Messiah is going to be pierced in his hands and his feet. Isaiah 53 predicted that the Messiah would pray for the ones who were crucifying him. Does that sound familiar? When Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Psalm 22, again, predicted that he's going to be mocked and insulted by those standing around. Psalm 69 says he's going to be given vinegar to drink. Isaiah 53 said he's going to be buried in a rich man's tomb. Now, these are details that could not possibly be by happenstance. You see, brothers and sisters, the cross was not an accident. The cross was not something that happened in a reactionary form where God said, okay, we've got to figure out something to do now. No, 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 no. Listen, the cross was the plan all along. You say, Ron, why is the cross so important? Why does the cross matter so much? Why should, as that old great hymn, why should we cling to the old rugged cross? Well, I'll tell you why. There's reasons that we ought to thank God for the cross. All right, you ready? Number one, we ought to thank God for the cross because the truth is this. The reason the cross was necessary 
is because of our sin. The reason the cross was necessary what was our sin. The Bible says this, that the soul who sins will surely die. And you're familiar. We've talked about this before, how sin came into the world. If you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, we see creation. Genesis 3, Adam and Eve falling into sin. Eve deceived by the serpent who was more crafty than any other beast of the field. He comes and he says, has God really said, brothers and sisters, sin often starts with questioning the word of God, the truthfulness of God, and the goodness of God. So he comes and he begins to cause Eve to question, is God really good? Does God really love me? Does God really have my best interest at heart? And so she began to listen to these lies and as a result, she disobeyed the one command God gave. God said, you can eat anything in the garden, just don't eat from that tree. And what did they do? They did the one thing that God had told them not to. And you see, that's what ushered sin into the world. Romans chapter 5 says it this way, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Listen to me. If it weren't for the sin in the garden, there would be no coronavirus. There would be no funeral home. There would be no cemeteries. There would be no hospitals. There would be no children's cancer wards. There would be no sex slavery. There would be none of the curse of sin that we see on our earth. There would be no devastating tsunamis and hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes. But creation itself groans under the curse of sin. And that sin came because Adam and Eve disobeyed a clear command of God. You see, through their disobedience, sin come, came rushing into the world. And since then, death has spread to all men. The Bible recounts that it is appointed unto man once to die. And you see, this sin, it, it, it leads to shame, doesn't it? It's sad that we live in a day where some will commit sin and they will flaunt their sin. But for those of us who know Christ, sin leads to shame. We are ashamed. We sin and the Holy Spirit convicts us and we're mindful of that and we are ashamed. That's what Adam and Eve did. You remember? They sinned against God. And what, the, what was the first thing they did? When they heard God walking, they went and hid. God asked them, where, where are you? We're hiding from you. Can I ask you something? What are you attempting to hide from God today? Where are you trying to hide? Because I need to tell you something. You can't hide from God. Sin enters the world. Shame enters the world. And more importantly, Sin builds a wall between us and God. It separates us. Isaiah 59 says it this way. That great prophet, Isaiah, says this. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. I pray that all the time. I pray that verse all the time. Oh God, your arm's not shortened so that it can't save. Your ear is not dull of hearing. But don't forget verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken falsehood and your tongue mutters wickedness. Do you see the picture? Adam and Eve's sin that's passed down to us. And brothers and sisters, it would be easy for us to sit here and blame Adam and Eve. But can I tell you something? We can only blame them so much when we choose to do the same thing that they did. We have more. We have light, don't we? We have the Word of God that tells us how we should live, and yet we rebel and live another way. And notice, he says, your sins have separated you from God. 
And if you're here and you're listening to this broadcast and you see me, I'm telling you, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you right now are on the other side of the separating wall of God. You are separated from God. You are without God, without hope, without eternal life. And I'm, I'm begging you, at the end of this message, you're going to have an opportunity to turn and give your life to Jesus Christ. And I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you, would you do it? We praise God for the cross because in spite of our sin, God made a way. Well, secondly, there's another reason why we praise and thank God for the cross. Secondly, the cross is the place where God the Father poured out His holy, unmitigated wrath upon sin on His Son. I think about my children. I would gladly give my life for them. I would lay down my life so that they could be saved. There's nobody that I would choose to let them live in the place of my children. Would not happen. But that's exactly what God did. The cross is the place where God poured out his wrath on his son. Some want to betray God. And you see it often in the media. You see it often in these references to God, particularly in times of national difficulty and crisis like we're in now. They say, oh, well, call out to your higher power. Come on. We don't get to paint the picture of who God is. God has already revealed himself. God is not some doting grandfather who will welcome you in in your rebellion, shaking your fist in his face, saying, I reject your son, I reject your way, I reject your word, but just give me blessings. Brothers, it's not going to happen. You see, because not only is God love, God is love. But God is also holy. And God's holiness causes him to have a holy, wrath-filled hatred for sin. He has unmitigated wrath toward sin. There are multiple scriptures that present this. And while I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of places where you will not hear this. A lot of pastors, a lot of preachers, a lot of ministries will shy away from this reality. But brothers and sisters, if we miss this, we miss the glory of the cross. You see, Exodus 22 says it this way. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword. That doesn't sound like the big guy up in the sky to me, does it you? Leviticus 26. But in spite of this, you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury. 2 Kings 22. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us. Because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book and do according to all that is written concerning us. Notice what it says. The wrath of the Lord is kindled against us. God's anger against people. Ezra chapter 8. The hand of our God is for good on all who seek him. And the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. Psalm 21. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath. And fire will consume them. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Well, Ron, you, you, you don't have a fully developed theology. You see, you've just quoted Old Testament verses. You, you've missed the fact that Jesus is love, that God loves us. You've missed that. Your theology is a little warped, is it? 
The Bible records in the book of Hebrews that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You say, Ron, well then why aren't you talking about wrath out of the New Testament? Okay, how about John 3, 36? He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God literally abides on him. The wrath of God abiding on him, remaining on him, placed on him. Whoever does not obey the Son, the, the wrath of God abides on him. Romans 1.18 the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, ungodlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Romans 1, but Romans 2. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When his righteous judgment will be revealed. Let me give you just one more. Romans 2, 8. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. So you say, Ron, that's bad news. And can I be honest with you? It's not bad news. It's terrible news. But the story of the Bible doesn't end there. You see, the second thing that we're thanking God for is that the cross is the place where God has placed his unmitigated wrath due sin on his son. You see, wrath has to be, the, the justice of God has to be appeased. The holiness of God demands that sinners be punished. And so we need someone to take the wrath of our sin upon himself so that we don't have to. We need someone to take the debt that we owe and pay it in full. That's exactly what Jesus has done. You see, he is, the Bible used this word. It uses the word propitiation. You say, what in the world is propitiation? Now, I can't even spell it. Well, I'd struggle too, all right? Listen, propitiation is literally the sacrifice that atones for sin. That's the, biblical, that's the biblical idea of propitiation, all right? First John says it this way, My little children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. I'm thankful to God that it said for the whole world, because I'm included in that. You see, you needed someone to endure the condemnation and the wrath of God that you deserve for your sin. Jesus takes this cup of wrath. When Jesus said, Father, let this cup pass from me. That's what he's referring to. For throughout the Old Testament, the picture of God's wrath is called the cup of God's wrath being poured out. And so Jesus said, Father, if it's possible, let this wrath pass from me. Let this unmitigated fury against sin pass from me. But I thank him that he, that he, then he said, right after that he said, but nevertheless not my will but yours be done. The irony of that statement in the Gospel of Mark when they said, ha, he saved others. Let him save, but he can't save himself. Let me tell you something. He could have saved himself. There's an old hymn. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and for me. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. That's why we must take this gospel to the whole world. And notice John's writing to believers. That's why he says he is propitiation for our sins He's speaking to those inside the family of God. He, he, man, he paid the price for our sins, but not for ours only. 
The church is not a country club. The church does not exist for its own glory and good. It exists for the glory of God and for the good of others. That's why we talk about it over and over again. You know this. We exist to glorify God by making disciples in Alma and in every nation. How we do that is by loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourselves. You see, he is the propitiation for our sins, but not ours only for the sins of the whole world. And you see, he's the sacrifice that atones for our sin. But can I tell you something? He does something else. He reconciles us to God. He brings us together with God. He brings us. He is making intercession for us. You see, that wall that separates us from God, thank God because of the cross, has been broken down. The way is open to him before the cross, we were separated from God's presence. But because of the cross, we now have access and can come boldly. Did you notice the little seemingly insignificant detail in, the, in Mark's account? Where he mentioned that the veil was rent from top to bottom. Now, for those of us who are just listening to the story, we, we might not think a lot about that. But remember that the veil was what separated the holy place from the holy of holies. When the priests would go in and offer atonement on the day of Passover, Yom Kippur, he would offer the sacrifice, the blood to cover for the sins of the people. And I don't know that it's exactly at the same moment, but I have a, I have a sneaking suspicion that the moment that Jesus Christ died was the moment that the high priest was in the holy of holies sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat. And that veil was torn from top to bottom saying, you don't need a priest anymore. Jesus, the great high priest, has offered not the blood of bulls and goats, but his own blood, a sacrifice for many. He pays the price for our sin. He is the atoning sacrifice. He is the reconciler between God and man. And our our gap has been bridged. The wall has been torn down. Where do you get that from, Ron? Ephesians chapter 2. Let me give you a quote. I, I like what Dr. Platt said. He said, before the cross, we were afraid of God. But because of the cross, we're now the friends of God. Before the cross, we were afraid of God. We trembled at his presence. It was like the Israelites when Moses would go up on the mountain and it would shake and lightning and thunder and the people were afraid to go. But now we've been welcomed into his presence. And the cross bridges the gap. I know here living in South Georgia, we have a lot of good moral and ethical people. But can I tell you something? Morality and ethical behavior will not get you any closer to heaven than anything else. You don't deserve to be in heaven. All of the moral behavior and ethical behavior that you can possibly engage in will never overcome one sin. Not even one. You need somebody to bridge the gap. You say, oh, Ron, I'm religious. I, I'm a faithful church member. Church membership won't get you to heaven. Well, I'm generous with my time and my talents and my resources. That is commendable, commendable and a biblical obligation for followers of Christ. It's not going to get you to heaven. You know what? The only thing that can break down the wall is the cross. Notice what Jesus said. Notice what Ephesians 2 says. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one man, thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. Notice he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall that our sin had built. So we thank God for the cross. 
we thank him that he responded. He responded to our need by sending his son. We thank God that he allowed his son to take our place and bear our, our wrath. We thank God that through the cross, the wall that has separated us from God, that would separate us for all of eternity, has forever been broken down through the cross. Can I tell you one more thing? The cross isn't the end. The cross isn't the end. You see, we've seen tracks into the grave before. Every religious leader before and after Jesus has marched into the grave. But no one else has gotten up. You see, Jesus is different. He is just. And the just, God is just and the just are the one who has faith in Jesus. I'm telling you what, Jesus gave his life for us. He laid it down, but thank God he had the power to take it up again. Listen, the cross is not the end. The cross doesn't end the story of Christianity, because if it did, it would be a sad, sad tale of misplaced hope, broken dreams, and sheer devastation no cross isn't the end there's a great preacher by the name of S.M. Lockridge some of you may have heard this I love that every time I listen to him man I just get I just get so fired up I can't hardly stand it and I thought it'd be a blessing to you I I was going to read it in my best S.M. Lockridge voice but when you hear him you'll understand why I can't I want you to Listen for just a moment to this great truth. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter's are sleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilots struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sunday's are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirit's burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday, but let me tell you something, Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming, it's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. 
It's Friday. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My king yields his spirit. It's Friday. Hope is lost. Death has won. Sin has conquered. And Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard. And a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. I'm thankful that Friday is not the end of the story. We ought to thank God for the cross. You see, the cross provides the remedy for our sin. The cross enables us to avoid God's just wrath on sin. The cross broke down the, the wall of separation. The cross isn't the end. So what should our response be? You ready? Number one. For some of us who are watching this broadcast, the weight of our sin has come before us. We've seen the truth that we deserve this wrath. So to you, my friend, I would say your response would be to repent. Repentance is turning from your sin and trusting in Christ. That was the message that Jesus preached in Mark chapter 1, the very first sermon that he preached. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You see, faith and repentance are inextricably linked. We trust Christ and we turn from sin. Luke 13 says it this way, no, but I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Acts 3, Peter said it this way, repent and turn back that your sin may be blotted out. And for my friends who are here who've never trusted Christ, hear the words of 2 Peter 3, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. It is not His will that you die and go to hell. He wants you saved. He wants to save you. And part of that is turning from sin and trusting in Christ. How do I do that? We pray something from the depths of your heart. Oh God, forgive me. I know that I'm a sinner. I deserve to be punished. Lord, forgive me. Change me. Use me. Make me into the person that you want me to be. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. Your word promises if I'll do that, I'll be saved. Save me. Change me. Do you just do that? From the depths of your heart? From the depths of your soul crying out to God? The Bible says that whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But there's some of us here who we're, we're followers of Jesus. We've gotten tied up in things that we know we shouldn't. Repentance is not just for salvation. Repentance is critical for sanctification. If we're to become more like Christ, as he reveals things to us, we need to turn from them and trust him anew. doesn't mean that we get saved again, but it does mean that we are turning from the sin that he illuminates and we're trusting in him alone. We're following after him with everything in us. So repent. Second, I think we ought to rejoice. You know, there's a lot of things in the world that give us great sorrow. There are great things that cause us great consternation. There are things that, particularly in a time like this, are heavy. But we can rejoice, can't we? That God didn't leave us lost in our sin. That God poured out the wrath that we deserved on His Son. 
that the cross bridged the gap between us and God. And the cross is not the end of the story. We ought to rejoice. Lastly, not only repent, not only rejoice, we ought to resolve today, I'm going to follow after Jesus. I'm going to, nothing, nothing else matters. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. No turning back. Resolve. To make a difference in your home. To make a difference with your neighbors. To make a difference in your faith family. To make a difference in our neighborhood, in our county. And to make a difference in every nation. If there has ever been a time to lay aside our sin and run after Jesus, it's now. If there's ever been a time that we should turn from our sin and trust in Christ, it's now. If there's ever been a time for the church at First Baptist Alma, the body of believers here, to rise up, it's now. If there's ever been a time to praise the Lord for what He has done, my brothers and my sisters, it is now. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Pastor Justin is going to lead us in a great song. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. What a glorious reality. Pray with me. Lord, speak to us now. And may we obey in Jesus' name. was crowned with glory, is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet, now at His feet we bow. The one who wore our sin and shame robed in majesty the radiance of perfect love when love shines for all to see your name your name is victory our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. The fear that held us now gives way to Him who is our peace. His fire no breath upon the cross is now alive in me. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name. Spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. 
He's resurrecting me. The tomb where soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Our God has robbed the grave. Our God has robbed the spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name I come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me he's resurrecting resurrecting me brothers and sisters thank you again so much for being a part of this worship gathering I can't wait to see you soon I can't wait for us to be joined back together at this point we don't have a definite timeline as to when that's going to happen I know that our city and our, they're saying the end of April for sure. So I'd ask you to do something. I, I'd really encourage you to, to pray, to seek the Lord's face, to stay at home as much as you can, and ask the Lord to be merciful to us in this time. I look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. I love you. We'll see you soon.